Hello, my friend. This is Michael Criswell with Relentless Heart. And I want to thank you for reaching out uh, to my wife and I in your pain to get some help. I understand. I have been exactly where you're at. I, for the first three years, three and a half years of this ministry, to the best of my ability, I tried to reply to each and every person that contacted me. And I really was blessed by it, and I believe a lot of other people were too. But I knew always that the time would come if God willed it, the volume of requests would surpass my ability to serve them. And in answer to that, I've decided to invite you this morning as I'm sitting here on my wife and I's front porch at our apartment in Hyderabad, India. I'm having some coffee. I'd like to invite you to join me with a cup of coffee. Perhaps you and I can pretend like we're at a Starbucks. <laughs> I'll ask your forgiveness for the sounds. It's a rainy morning and you'll hear all kinds of sounds of Indians getting ready in the morning and perhaps our neighbor's dog will start barking. But I just wanted to be able to sit down and have a candid heart-to-heart -heart conversation with you in an effort to try to encourage you and to try to help you fully understand the most important single subject about how I and many, many others have found the blessing and the presence and the help of God in our life, indeed in the most difficult times of our life. In three and a half years of doing this ministry, I've discovered that there are basically two categories of people once I've had contact with them. There are those who no matter what they've gone through, find God's help and His blessings and His presence in their life. And then there are those who do not. And I paid attention to what the differences were. And I asked the Father to help me to understand not only my journey, how did I get from where we were at to where we're at today, but how have you worked in the lives of others? And Lord, help me to see what it is, the difference between those who find you and your help and those who do not. My friend, I remember being exactly where you're at. I want you to know you're not alone. I have heard stories from all over the world where at one time I thought my story was certainly one of the worst I had heard. And I tell you, my friend, I've heard stories now that make mine look like a Sunday afternoon walk on a beach. And I want you to know that there are other people besides just me. I'm not the only one. I just so happen to be called into a full-time vocational ministry to tell people about what God had done in my life. And I had the resources at the time to make a, a story about it. But there are many other people right now who all over the world, they have either been through what you're going through and worse, or they're actually going through it with you right now. These are the kind of emails that we receive on a daily basis from all over the world. Let me just read a couple of these and see if you can identify yourself with maybe some of the pains you're going through. Dear Michael, my wife left me and took the children and now she has turned them against me. I am in excruciating pain and I do not know what to do. Dear Michael, my quote unquote Christian husband left me for another woman and took all of our savings and left me with nothing. I am hurt and scared to death. Another email. My husband tried to murder me and then killed himself. The next man I dated committed suicide. Something is terribly wrong with me. I was about to end my life when God brought me to your story. Dear Michael, our daughter is dead. We believe her husband killed her for the insurance money, but the court is so corrupt and unjust that he has gotten off the hook completely. Now he has even turned other family members against us, and we haven't seen our grandchildren in years. We are completely devastated by this evil and at a complete loss of what to do. 
Dear Michael, my husband took me from my family and my country. He married me and then brought porn into our marriage three days after we wed. He abuses me verbally, emotionally, spiritually, and even a bit physically. My marriage and my life have been a living hell for 27 years. Please help. I don't know how much longer I can take it. Another email. I am so frustrated with my life. Why won't God allow me to find a godly spouse? I am so lonely. Why doesn't He care about my needs? I have been hurt by so many people, and He doesn't seem to care. Dear Michael, I've been unable to find work for a few years. I've gone through most of our savings. My wife is growing increasingly impatient, and now my children are worried. I've been praying, but to no avail. I'm scared to death. I don't know what to do. Please help me. Another email. My husband had two affairs and got one of the women pregnant. I forgave him and we reconciled. Later, he became very sick for many months and I stayed at home to nurse him back to health. Once he got healthy, he left me for the woman he had the child with. Dear Michael, I am in an unequally yoked marriage. I thought for sure he would come to Christ. And even though he was so mean to me and hated my love for God, my church told me I just had to stay and wait it out. It's been 21 years and there is nothing left of me. I am an absolute shell of what I once was in Christ. I sinned against God by marrying Him and then made it worse by not leaving Him sooner. Now I have paid the ultimate price. I have lost my vibrant relationship with Christ and I believe my salvation because my life is now being used as evil in the lives of others. Another email. I am tormented in my thoughts and have no peace in my life. I have family members that are messing with the occult and now I'm seeing shadows, hearing voices in my head and being tormented by demons. Please help me. Dear Michael, I'm only 32 and already suffering from erectile dysfunction. Because I have been addicted to pornography, because I have been addicted to porn and masturbation since I was 17, I cannot stop. I know I am doomed to hell. Can you please help me? Dear Michael, my marriage was on the rocks for years and I made a mistake of allowing a young lady that works for me to get too close to me. I was a fool and had inappropriate relationship with her, but it never led to sex. But because of her age, I'm now facing up to 20 years in jail and possibly having to register as a sex offender, which will absolutely destroy my life. I didn't do anything to deserve this, and the young lady and her parents tried to defend me, but my ex-wife, who is out to get blood, knows the judges and the district attorney, and she is out to destroy me. Please help me. I am scared to death. Dear Michael, I cannot stop smoking pot. I know it's wrong, but it's the only way I can get any peace. But then soon after I feel guilt and shame and the only way I can get any relief is to smoke even more weed. I love God, but I can't stop this sin. Please help me. My friend, that's only just a short sample that I've received from people in just the last three and a half years that I've been doing this. I want you to know you're not alone, but I also want you to know that some of these people received God's help. Some of these people found God indeed in their storm, but unfortunately, many others of them still have not. Many others of them have been defeated and they continue to be weighed down by the worries of life. They continue to suffer defeat at the hands of their own sinful, unwise, foolish choices in their life, the hand of the devil who beats them down where they have no strength left to stand up and trust God, the evil things that are being done to them by others, and a lack of a desire to continue to fight and find God. My friend, 
I could spend 10 lifetimes trying to help each individual that contacts me find the specific answers to their specific problems, including yours. I mean, imagine for a moment right now how much happiness you would feel and relief you would feel if you could say a prayer and God would instantly fix all of your circumstances in your life. Or if you could contact me and I could give you the exact answer and solution to your problem, you would probably be thrilled. But my friend, I want to tell you something, that there's something far more important to the Father. If you are one of His elect, if you are one of those who through His foreknowledge He saw before you were born that you would actually make a choice to believe in Him and to follow Him, then Romans 8.29 teaches us that God's primary purpose in your life is for you to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's top priority for your life is relationship with you. He desires to know you. He desires for you to be able to say that you walked with God. He does not desire for you and I to be able to say that we were Christians in the sense that we had a relationship with Christianity. God does not desire that we have churchianity. God does not desire to have us being religious, mindless robots. But God desires to have a living, breathing, daily, interactive relationship with you, whereby moment by moment throughout your life, the Father is your absolute greatest conscious reality. My friend, every day of my life, the Lord Jesus is walking with me. It doesn't mean that I don't have moments where He allows me to be touched by evil or He allows me to be tempted or He allows me to feel my weakness. But God has given me victory over the world, victory over my flesh, victory over sin. By the grace of Christ, I'm now able to serve Him from a position of freedom and to love Him as a son from a position of freedom, not in a position of weakness fighting for freedom. There is nothing greater in this life and there's no greater purpose for your life than for you to know God. In fact, Jesus Christ says in John 17 that this is eternal life. You want to live forever? You're already going to live forever. You're either going to live forever with God or live forever without God. But eternal life, as Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, is to have Christ in your life, not as a cherry on the top, as a garnishment, where you have built your entire life like an ice cream sundae. You got the dish, you put in the ice cream, you slice the bananas, you put on the whipped cream, you put on whatever other flavors you want, and then you put a cherry on the top. Today, many of us are working and completely consumed with our lives. You, I, I want to ask you to bear with me and get this message, okay? Because this is going to be probably the most important message you've ever heard if you are now where I once was. Jesus cannot be the cherry on top in your life. Jesus has to be the dish. He has to be everything in your life. The majority of the people who are contacting me, their life in some way is not working the way they want it to. It's causing them pain. The human response, the instinctive response, if I had you lay your hand on a table and I smashed your finger, even lightly, with a metal object or a hammer, your human instinct would be to immediately withdraw. You wouldn't have to consciously make a decision. You would immediately withdraw. This human instinct is still powerful in your life when you're going through pain. Your first instinct with human reasoning is to withdraw and separate from that pain. And that is in an effort for you to rebuild your life my friend, the majority of people that contact me, including myself at one time, and I really believe probably including you, 
we're so fixated on fixing the pain in our life, what the Father looks down from heaven and sees is not somebody who's following the command of Christ to lose their life, but he sees somebody who's doing the exact opposite, trying to find their life. My friend, God has fantastic reasons for allowing pain and suffering into our life. He uses it to break us. He uses it to discipline us. Or if we're maturing, He uses it to test us. But so many people that contact me, those principles don't even apply because we have not, as Christians, followed the very basic, the very fundamental, foundational teaching of Jesus Christ to surrender and entirely lay down our life and come to the place of absolute surrender where we cry out to God and we say, Father, not my will be done, your will be done. Do you know that in John 8, 51, Jesus Christ says, I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my words, he will never see death. You would like to live forever with Jesus Christ, but most of us don't want to give up the life that we have in this life in order to have the life that has come. That is the problem for most of us, my friend. The majority of Christians today that contact me or contact, I'm sure, countless other ministries and want to talk about all of their problems and all of their messes and how the devil has done this and how their ex has done this, all of this stuff, my life is not working, I'm in pain, I doubt my salvation, my life doesn't seem worthy, whatever the problem is, these people are people who have not yet understood the most fundamental, basic teaching of Jesus Christ. Matthew 16, 24 through 27, Jesus Christ says, I tell you the truth, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He goes on to say, whoever loves his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will find it. He says, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world? and lose his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? My friend, what would it benefit you honestly if God answered every prayer you've been crying out and gave you the fixes, the solutions to all the problems that you're having and you ultimately had the good life in this life? What would, be, what would this benefit you to then stand before Jesus Christ? When you die and hear him say to you, you've already had your good life. You were unwilling to lose your life for me. You were unwilling for my will to be done in your life. No, that dead marriage was more important to you than me. Your children were more important to you than me. Your siblings were more important to you than me. Your career, your money, the opinions of your neighbors, the opinions of your colleagues, my friend, you may think what I'm saying to you is radical, but do you know that the person that is our Lord, our God, who you call yourself, I presume, by His name when you say you are a Christian, says that if anyone comes to Him in Luke 14, 25 through 33, He says, if anyone comes to Me and He doesn't hate His mother and father, His brother and sister, his wife and children, yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. In Luke 14, he says, I tell you, if anyone comes to me and doesn't give up everything he has, he cannot be my disciple. My friend, a lot of people that I come in contact with, they would be more respected by God and perhaps you would be too. If you would walk away like the rich young ruler, sad, rather than continue to grumble against God, or rather than try to live a Christianity that is a false Christianity. My friend, I have to tell you, there is absolutely no other way to find the blessing of God. I wish, listen, I wish there was an easier way. I wish I could tell you I have the answers to your problems. People want me to give them answers to their problems, but I tell you it does little to no good for most people. 
They get one area of their life fixed only to ultimately lose it before the Lord Jesus Christ. What good is this? It does no good whatsoever. My friend, I want to encourage you to be willing to lose your life. Use this opportunity that you're going through now to find Jesus Christ in fullness. You see, you're humbled right now. And that's a prerequisite to finding God and finding His truth, is you have to become like a child, Matthew 18, 3 through 4, and humble yourself. Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom of God is the person who humbles himself as a little child. You're humbled right now. Look at the difference between your life and who you're reaching out to for help and crying out to God and crying out to me versus maybe other friends and family members whose lives seem to be working pretty well. They, they actually appear to be getting along with, without God pretty well or maybe even with God. In fact, their circumstances are, are quite lovely. And maybe they call themselves a Christian and they are very busy and active in Bible studies and all this stuff. And they feel for sure God is with them because their circumstances are blessed. My friend, we live in the New Covenant, and the New Covenant has absolutely nothing to do with the Old Covenant. I don't want to get too far down this road, but many, many Christians are completely deceived about what God is to do for them when they give their life to Him or they put their faith in Him. We are not under the covenant that Moses and Abraham and David and Solomon were under, where God blesses us primarily externally when we follow all the law. We're not even under the law. In fact, if you're under the law, you are cursed. We're in the new covenant. We have a much better covenant with better promises. Jesus tells the disciples, don't be afraid, little children. Don't be afraid, little flock. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. The Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom of God. They never had this in the old covenant. You know that you can have such closeness with God in this life that no matter what you go through, no matter what God allows the devil to take away from you, no matter what God allows the devil to torment you with, you can still, at the end of every day, praise God for His goodness and experience His peace and His joy and His rest and have absolutely nothing. Because you fully gave your life to Him, God will fully give His life to you. There is no other way. Listen, the condition, okay? It's a, a covenant is an agreement, but it's even stronger than an agreement. The agreement that God makes with you and I in the new covenant is that you have to lose your life in order to find the life, the spiritually abundant life. There is no other way. My friend, at this point in time, the majority of things that you have in your life, like me, when I was 19 years calling myself a Christian, I acquired these things outside of God's will. They were not God's plan for my life. These were things I went out and acquired for my life, no different than Abraham's acquiring Ishmael through Hagar. That was not God's plan. God was pleased to allow it, and then he redeems it because he knows that Abraham loved him, and he knows that Abraham had a level of ignorance, and he knows that Abraham's not perfect, and he knows that Abraham's the first to follow him in faith. But that was not God's plan. And so God stripped him of it. Now imagine for a second that Abraham was putting as much effort into fixing the relationship between Sarah and Hagar and as much effort in keeping that family unit together as you and I were in doing the same thing in our life. If Abraham put the same kind of effort into fixing his life that you and I do, and if Abraham refused to let go of the idea that he needed to send off that woman and that son, that he had acquired outside of God's will, if he wanted to death grip it and hold on to it, my friend, I can't even imagine how the story in, in the Bible might have changed. I can't even imagine the implications of that. Thanks be to God that he gave Abraham the grace to fully surrender, to fully yield his will to God's will for his life, and to do it. My friend, God will do the same thing for you, but I want you to see that there is no such thing as getting God's help without full surrender of your life. And you know whether or not you have given your life wholly over to Jesus Christ. You know whether or not you've cried out, Oh God, not my will be done, but yours. Maybe you did for a time and then you picked it back up and you took it back from God. Maybe God tested you for a time to see if you really meant it and you drifted back into the world and you drifted back into the self-life. Maybe you were trying in your own effort. My friend, the only way I have been able to do what I've been able to do, the only way my wife has been able to do what she's been able to do, is by the grace of God. But we had a desire, and I'm going to get to a part in this message where I'm going to tell you what the, 
what I see to be biblically the number one difference between people that can surrender and people that cannot. And I want to help you see that, my friend, you and I are absolutely deceiving ourselves. I believe you have three choices when you listen to this message. Number one, you can do the right thing and the only thing that will bring life. You can surrender your life and everything in it. Your health, your wife or, or husband, your children, your family members, your colleagues, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, your neighbors, you can surrender everything, your possessions, your money, everything. You put it all on God's table. You can do that and make a full surrender. Hating your life in this world so that you will keep it for eternal life. Or you can do like the rich young ruler. And when Jesus Christ identifies that thing that's in your heart, even though you've been a good quote unquote Christian and you've been following all the rules and you're a good, decent person, my friend, good, decent people don't go to heaven. It's not about behavior modification. You have to be doing God's will. And the only way to do God's will is to allow Him to have first place in your heart at all times and in all ways. And by His grace, to be able to walk that out. And you won't be perfect at it day one. But you cannot have anything or anyone that you love more than God. If you do, my friend, you're fooling yourself. And I would beg you to have the courage to do option number two. If you don't want to fully give your life to God, if you're only interested in what God can do for you to fix your life, then you don't really want God. You want God's stuff. You want His power, but you don't want Him. My friend, when we go to God, most of us are going to Him in hopes that He will give us what we want. And we give Him religion called Christianity, or we give Him worship, or we sing to Him, or we do Bible studies for Him, and we go to conferences for Him, and we talk about Him, and we witness for Him, and we work for Him. Why? Most of the time because we want God to do something good for us in the here and now. My friend, I'm going to talk to you why this is a problem in just a minute. I want to help you see what God has already done for you good that maybe you don't fully realize or what God can do for you good that you have yet to attain. God will have more respect for you and so will I if you don't want to fully surrender your life to God for you to walk away sad like the rich young ruler did rather than choice three. Choice three is, you don't have to be like the rich young ruler today. You don't have to walk away sad. You, we have something in, in our dispensation, our time, that the rich young ruler did not have. Let me tell you what the rich young ruler did not have that you and I have. When the rich young ruler was confronted about money being his God, See, he had kept all the rules. He was a good rule follower. He was well behaved. He was beyond that. He was keeping since his youth all of the Ten Commandments. But God saw in his heart he still loved money. And Jesus Christ taught you cannot serve two masters. You will either be devoted to the one and despise the other, or you will love the one and hate the other. When Jesus identifies for the rich young ruler that money is his issue and that his decisions in daily life are being made more by his desire for money or his need for money, that means he is serving a master other than God. Money is his master. And that's why he despises God and walks away sad. If the rich young ruler lived today, my friend, he wouldn't have to walk away sad. He could be like umpteen millions of other Christians who all they have to do is to walk just down the street to a different church or click a few more videos away from this one to find a different message that will provide you a different Jesus, a different gospel by a different spirit. If you don't like the Jesus that demands all, that tells you you must lose your life to find it, that you must hate your life in this world to keep it, that tells you that unless you die, you will remain only a single seed, but if you die, you will bear much fruit. The Jesus that says everyone will be salted with fire. The Jesus that said I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. If you don't like that Jesus who says if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it out and throw it away, 
If your right hand or right foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If you don't like the Jesus who demands that you forgive others in order for you to be forgiven, my friend, all you have to do is click just a few more clicks on YouTube right now where you're listening to this message. And you will find umpteen thousands of different messages about an entirely different Jesus, an entirely different gospel, and an entirely different spirit. It's an easy Jesus. It's a Jesus who can offer you your best life now and heaven to come. It's a Jesus who will tell you that I came that you may have abundant prosperity and wealth and health beyond your wildest dreams. And a Jesus that will tell you, oh, you have to give up some, but you don't have to give up all. My friend, you will be deceived. The number one thing Jesus Christ spoke of as it relates to the end times, when the disciples were inquiring about end times, the first thing that Jesus tells them is, be sure that no one deceives you. We have been warned repeatedly in the scriptures that there will come false apostles masquerading as apostles of Christ, but they are actually agents of the devil servants of the devil who himself masquerades as an angel of light. We see repeatedly that Peter tells us there were false prophets back then, there will be false teachers among you. There is no shortage of people who twist and pervert the scriptures to their own destruction. So you have three choices the way I see it. You can completely take advantage of this opportunity that God has allowed for brokenness in your life. You can lighten up your grip on your life as you have built it and as you have desired it. You can release those white knuckles that you have on your life and on those people in your life or whoever it is, and you can open up your hand and live detached to anything in this world except for the will of God and Christ in your life. And you can then find the fullness and the blessing of Christ like you've never known. Oh, you're gonna pay a cost. Oh, there's going to be some pain and suffering. My friend, it hurts to give up everything for Jesus. But Jesus will give you the grace to do it. Okay? It hurts to die. Jesus was not telling jokes in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was not laughing and cutting up when the Pharisees were throwing all of these stones at him like they were, verbally, emotionally, spiritually. Okay? But he endured the cross, scorning its shame for the joy set before him. My friend, there is a life and a peace and a joy and a rest and a contentment, a fruitfulness. There's a knowing God. There's a pleasure being known of God. The Bible says he who loves God is known by God. You can't imagine what this can do for you. If God wants to strip you of everything you have in your life and of every person in your life like he did me, would you let him? My friend, if you say no, I want to tell you why you're unwilling to do this. I want to get down to what the bottom foundational issue is of why some people seemingly can give all to God and others cannot. And I want to warn you, if you do not give up everything for Jesus Christ, if you think you have a better way or you think there's a better gospel or you think that you know being a disciple doesn't apply to you, when Jesus says, whoever and anyone if you can find a way to wiggle out of being a whoever and anyone, you're better than I am, because I couldn't, okay? But I tell you the truth, if you and I don't give everything to Jesus Christ and we think there's an easier way, or we look, you look at my life and you think somehow or another, God asked me to do something he's not asking you to do, because after all, like I'm in ministry, my friend, I tell you, God will use people like my wife and will condemn you at the last day. My wife was sitting here hidden, unknown to anybody in the world. And you know something? She did the exact same thing I did, and she did it independent of me. God led her down the same road that he has countless tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and perhaps millions of people have discovered over 2,000 years. There is only one way. It's the narrow way. And the narrow way is you have to be willing to give everything to God, not in pretense. Not, oh God, I'm going to lay down and surrender my will so that you'll do it for me. No. You have to completely abandon your will. You have to give him everything and let him do even with your own life. If Jesus says you have to hate your own life, how much more do you have to hate your family members? And what that means is you have to love God so much that when you obey him, it may appear to some of your family members that you indeed hate them. 
Say, for example, when God asked me to leave and move away from my children, you might not believe that's possible to do. And yet God's been doing that for thousands of years with people that he called into missions where they have to leave their children behind. I was just listening to a, a gentleman this morning, Andrew Murray, back in the 1800s. His parents had to send him off when he was 10 years old. He didn't see him again until he was 21. He ended up being one of the most godly people that's walked on the face of the earth. He gave everything to Jesus Christ. You have to be willing to give God everything. My friend, here's why. Everything you and I acquire in our life before we come to Christ, God sees as something we have acquired from a previous lover. The Bible says if we love the world, we are an adulterer. It says if, if anyone has uh, loves anything in the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So it, it comes down to this issue of love. Uh, one time I was asking the Father, perhaps you've heard this teaching before, where I say, Lord, do we really have to give up everything? Do we really have to always just lose everything to follow you? And the Lord gave me this, this vision of a man one day going into his wife's closet and he found a little box with a ring in it. He opened the rings and it's a it ring and it's a diamond engagement ring. And he confronts his wife and he says, Sweetheart, what is this? She has to explain to him then that it's a, it's a previous ring from a previous engagement that she had, that she had broken off. Immediately the man's heart becomes jealous, hurt. He asks, you know, what, why do you have this ring? What is this ring doing for you that I am not? Why do you need to keep this ring from a previous lover? And in the dream, the next part, I begin to see, wow, this is the way God sees every single thing that's in our life and every person. We've acquired these things from a previous lover called the world. Who is the God of this world? Satan. Who did Jesus Christ hear from that said they have control over all the kingdoms in the world and that they can give them to anybody they want? Satan. The Bible says Satan is the God of this world for this time. And he tells Jesus Christ, the Son of God, all of these kingdoms, they belong to me, and I can give them to whoever I want. So my friend, before you know God and before you know His truth and before you're walking in His ways, you have built a life with the help of the enemy of God. Now granted, He's a created enemy. He's a created being, so it's not like you know God's out of control. But nevertheless, you have acquired things in a broken, fallen world. And this world system being controlled by the devil and the flesh that rules alongside of him in this world, God sees as an opposing lover. So in the next part of the dream, I see the man hearing from his wife these words, Oh, honey, I only kept this ring because it was worth some money, and I thought perhaps maybe one day we may need to sell it for some extra money. Sweetheart, this ring means nothing to me. Here, please, do with it as you see fit. And he, so she surrendered this ring from her past into him. Now, this is where I asked the Lord, Does, Lord, do we have to, to lose everything? Does that mean that every person has to become like a Job or like me? Does, do we, does that mean we always lose everything? Not necessarily, because the next part of the dream he showed me is that she was giving this ring back, having fully surrendered it in her heart. And then he said to her, that's okay, we will go ahead and keep it. See, he just wanted to make sure that that ring was not in her heart. My friend, this is kind of tricky because there's a lot of things in your heart that you'll try to deceive yourself and, and tell God, oh, but that's not in your spot. But look at how your daily time is being spent. Look at how the decisions in your life are being spent. Think about maybe a person or money. And you try to tell God these things are not in the center of your heart. Yet when God looks at your life, how many of your daily thoughts and decisions are being given over to either to this person or to this money versus God? There you are. If that's you, there you are adding God back on like a cherry on the top. Oh, I do my Bible study. My friend, you cannot add God to your life. God has to be your life. Jesus Christ is your life. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Jesus Christ who lives in me. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God 
who loved me and gave himself for me. You have to lose your life. You can't add Christianity to the life you built and say that you are a child or daughter of God. This is the mistake that I made for 19 years. I was a good Christian, quote unquote Christian. I was doing the Bible studies. I was doing all the stuff. I was probably doing more Christian activity than most people. I was the MC of the men's group and did all the projects. I was feeding homeless people on some Sunday nights and was going to the Promise Keepers events and going to these conferences and at church twice a week and did all the churchy stuff, reading my Bible every day. I had a relationship with Christianity, not with God. My life and the Word of God was being choked off in my life by the worries of this life, Luke 8, by the deceitfulness of wealth and by the pursuit of other things. My friend, I know for a fact if I would have stayed in that condition, I would have never A, known God, and B, never made it to heaven. Jesus said it's a very narrow way. There's only one way to get in and to enter in through Jesus Christ, the gate for the sheep, and that is to lose your life for Him. The Bible says if we have been lowered in death with Him, we will be raised to life of Him. If we died with Christ, we will live. But if you haven't died with Him, if you haven't given Him your whole life, what an unbelievable opportunity you have to do that now. God has your attention right now. My friend, this season in your life is not going to last long. It's like when I moved to Alabama, they have this red dirt. It's hard. In order to put seed, farmers have to pulverize that ground with these big plows. You have to turn the soil up. If you just throw seed on the ground, that hard ground can't receive. The life in that seed will never result. The seed has to go below the ground, penetrating the surface, in order to then be nourished into something that produces life. Pulverizing that soil, you can imagine if that soil had nerves, the pain that it would go through, being broken up like that. I see that adversity is the same way in our life. God has used adversity in your life. He's frustrating your plans. Your life's not working like you want it to. This is God's mercy probably to you. It was mercy to me that God pushed my train off the tracks rather than keeping me to the end of my life and watching me run it right off the cliff into the abyss. My friend, when a farmer breaks up that soil, that season, that he has a limited window of which he can put the life-bearing seed in the ground. If he doesn't do it in that season, the sun and the rain come and bake that dirt back right to the clay hardness it was before. You have a limited window of opportunity. Your heart is hard. And God uses affliction to break that hard outer surface. You have an opportunity now to pour in the life-containing Word of God, the living Word in your life like you've never had before. But my friend, all the truth and all the Bible studies in the world are going to do nothing for you until you surrender your life and give Him everything. This is done in a moment, my friend. This isn't something that you learn how to do over years. In a moment, I gave my life to Jesus Christ, October 30th, 2009. I was suffering from Matthew 6, 24, trying to serve two masters. Maybe your master is something different than mine. Mine was money. I was doing all these good things, living a good Christian life, but still the majority of the decisions in my life were being made, and the majority of my focus on my life was all about money. My friend, that's evil, and you will go to hell. I was on my way to hell. Guaranteed. And so finally, God robbed me of my peace. I was making more and more money. I mean, $700,000. Have you ever made $700,000 in one year? Can you imagine how that might make you feel if you're a person who needs money? I could buy anything I wanted. I was living in a million dollar house. I had all the things that everybody told me would make me happy. God robbed me of my peace. I had no peace internally. I couldn't understand why this thing I had been chasing my whole life, thinking it would taste like steak, now tastes like water. Maybe for you it's a relationship or a career or a business or a ministry or a partner or whatever. I don't know what it is. God in His mercy allowed me to see it taste like water. So I fully surrendered and I decided, I said these words to God. I said, God, I have to have either all of you or none of you. 
I'm sick and tired of being torn between you and success. I can't do it anymore, God. I had a choice. I could have walked away sad like the rich young ruler and just continued on to please my ex-wife who wanted the lifestyle. She loved the money. Oh, she's in church every Sunday. Oh, she's a good little girl on the outside. She keeps the rules like a good Pharisee, but she loved money. She loved the good life and wasn't willing to lose her life in order to find it. I had already made all the money. I had already tasted it. I already knew what it felt like to be able to buy whatever I wanted. It, it left me nothing. It left me complete emptiness. I could have walked away sad, but I wanted the true God and I wanted the truth. And I realized in that moment, my life as a Christian hadn't turned out like I thought because I had been listening to men for all these years tell me an alternative Christianity. That's why I had never had to walk away sad for 19 years while I'm chasing money because I was living in a church age that told me I could have my cake and eat it too. That told me I could have Jesus and all the things I wanted. It was a lie. My friend, I never knew God like I do now until I found the truth and I was willing to walk in it. So that day, I literally said these words to God. And my friend, if you haven't said these words to God in your heart and meant it, then you haven't fully surrendered to Him. If you can't say like Peter and you can't look at the Lord and say, Lord, we have given up everything for you, Mark 10, 28. Are you better than Peter? Certainly you're not better than Jesus. And Jesus said... No servant is greater than his master. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are to do the same thing. Give his life. Paul says the one who's been saved by God through Jesus Christ is no longer to live their lives for themselves, but for the one who died for them. My friend, are you living your life for Jesus Christ? It's like my wife said to a family member not too long ago. I know you've been a good person. I know you've not done a lot of evil. I know you've avoided all the trashy things and the wickedness in life. But when you stand before Jesus and he says, what did you do for me while you were on earth? What will you say to him? Will you say to him, I cooked for the family? That makes you a Martha. God is looking for a Mary. He's looking for somebody who will give their whole life and being up to Him. You have three choices, my friend. You can fully surrender your entire life and heart to God. And yes, you're going to tremble doing it. Yes, you're afraid hearing this message. It's fearful. That's why God is so pleased with it. You're giving up something that cost you something. If God said to you, what has your faith in Christ cost you? If it cost him everything, if it cost Peter everything, if it cost Michael Criswell everything, if it cost Persis Criswell everything, what, what has it cost you? What can you say your faith has cost you? That's why Jesus said in Luke 14, you have to count the cost. Don't start building this life unless you think you can finish, because if you can't finish, people will ridicule you. He never said count your blessings. He said count the cost. But you have these three choices. You can fully surrender like Jesus Christ did. Christian means like Christ, like Peter did, like George Mueller did, like Hudson Taylor did, like Andrew Murray did, like D.L. Moody did, like Charles Spurgeon did, like countless thousands, like Amy Carmichael, like Gladys Allward, like thousands of unknown Christians that never did more for God than to suffer quietly for Him, but they suffered, they gave everything. There's, God only knows how many unnamed millions of Christians gave God everything, and you and I have never heard about how pleasing they were to God, because they, they were not in the limelight, they were in the back somewhere. Choice two, you can walk away sad like the rich young ruler, or choice three, you can stay where you're at and go find an alternative Christianity that will still end you up in hell. Jesus said there were going to be many who will say, Lord, we ate and drank with you and, and, and you preached in our streets and we danced with you and did all these things with you. And he says, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. My friend, don't let that be you. Now, I want to help in this final message with why is it that somebody like Persis, who lives in this culture that is so completely anti-God, the one true God, 
that is so dark, like darkness I've never seen in my life. The culture is so oppressive. Everybody is ruled by fear of what everybody else thinks. You've never seen people so concerned with what other people think about you than when you come to India. Everybody's concerned with everything externally. People make major decisions on their life, who they marry, the children they have, so forth and so on, based upon what other people think about them and what is the socially, normally accepted thing in society. To break out of that, like my wife did, you have to be willing to give up everything. You have to be willing to give up your reputation. You have to be willing to give up any love you expect to receive from your family, any money you may inherit from them, any goodwill from them, camaraderie, companionship. You have to be willing to give up everything. My wife did this in order to live a life free in Christ and to follow His will. Already at a young age, she had to begin to make sacrifices to break out of this culture. My friend, it's absolutely no different with Christ. Why was she then able to give everything in her life, give up her family, give up her job, give up the only desire she's ever had for a man to love. And when finally, after years of waiting, her quote unquote Prince Charming finally becomes the desire of her heart, why is it that she walked away? Why did she give up the thing which was the most important, the thing she had waited her whole life for? I'll tell you why. Why did I give up? Why was I willing to walk away from my children and walk away from a dead marriage instead of fighting for it? Why was, I, why was I willing to give up all that money? Why was I willing to suffer the loss of friends and reputation and be slandered and be willing to be homeless for a time? Why was I willing to lose all of those things? How did I do this? How have millions of other people done this? My friend, it comes down to one thing and one thing only. The people that give everything to God love Him more than anything in the world. If you're having a hard time time surrendering to God, if you're having a hard time obeying God and making sacrifices for God, giving up relationships, giving up material possessions, giving up your money, giving up your fears, giving up your worries, giving up whatever, if anything it is that you are holding on to consistently more than God, my friend, it's because you love it more than you love God. You will never enter into heaven loving anything in this life more than God. God made you for Himself. He did not make you to lose you to the things or somebody else in this world. There's no other way. Let me repeat this. There is no other way. So the person who loves God, why is it that some people love God more than others? Why is it that people claim to love God, but yet they can't give their life to Him? Because they don't love Him enough. I tell you, I believe the answer is as simple as Luke chapter 7, verse 47. I think it's the answer. I think it's the ultimate answer to all success in the Christian life. It's love, right? God is a God of love. We're called to love God and to love others. It's the greatest commandment. How do we get this love for God? A young man recently said, Michael, I'm willing to surrender to God, but yet I don't feel that strong love for Him yet. Why? And I said, oh, well, that's because you haven't been yet fully forgiven of all of the sins. God hasn't yet illuminated in your heart the wickedness that you've committed against Him, my friend. But when He allows you to see it, if He wills it for you to see it, and then He wills you to see what was done for you on the cross of Jesus Christ, my friend, when you see how much you have been forgiven, you all of a sudden will love God like nothing else you've ever loved in life. In Luke 7, 47, we have the Simon Pharisee and we have the sinful woman sitting at the feet of Jesus, anointing him. And Simon is perplexed, saying, man, if this was a real prophet of God, meaning Jesus, he would know that this woman is sinful. And Simon says, or Jesus says to Simon, Simon, I have something to tell you. He says, two men owed a certain moneylender a certain amount. One owed him, let's just use U.S. money, $50,000. Another owed him five hundred. dollars Neither of them could pay the debt back. So the money lender forgave both. He says to Simon, now which of these will love him more? Simon says, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt. Jesus said, you have answered correctly. And then he looks at the woman and he says, her many sins have been forgiven because she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, 
loves little. My friend, I'm going to make a bold statement to you. If you haven't fully surrendered your life to God and you feel it's impossible, you feel like you don't want to do it, you feel like it's easier to run to an alternative Christianity and go sit in false teaching, or you want to walk away sad, it's because you don't have any idea what you have been forgiven of. Maybe you, like the rich young ruler, feel like you've been keeping the rules pretty well, and after all, you're not quite as bad as the people in the 5 o'clock news. After all, most of the hurt in your life has come from other people, not yourself. It's been other people doing evil to you probably more than you have been to others. So that makes you pretty good in God's eyes, doesn't it? You're not as bad as those. My friend, you're no different than a Pharisee who looks down on others, being self-confident of his own righteousness. I've been there. I've done this. It's evil. That's how you live if you want to go to hell. You cannot look at the 5 o'clock evening news and conclude that you're not quite as bad as the guy who just killed a bunch of people in the movie theater. My friend, you're wicked. You've lived your life in rebellion against God, the very one who made you. You've, you've yet most likely to turn your life fully to Him. If that's the case, that makes you absolutely wicked. You've lived in a pride that says, I know better for my life than you do, God. You've lived as a thief saying, I belong to me, not to you. You've essentially stolen yourself from God. You've taken control of that which God made and that which God owns, and you've kept it aside for yourself. It makes you a thief. Surely you've used God's name in vain. Surely you've stolen something. Surely you've lied. You've cheated. Surely you've coveted somebody else's property, possession, or person. This makes you absolutely wicked in God's eyes because of how unbelievably holy the standard is that God is going to judge you and I by. You see, when you and I stand before God, He's not going to judge us according to the people we saw on the evening news. He's going to judge us according to the standard of His perfect, spotless, blameless, most holy, most shining, bright, Lamb of Lambs, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Great I Am, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the standard by which you and I are going to be judged. My friend, ask God to show you the filthiness in your heart. Ask God to reveal to you how wrong you are in God's eyes and how desperate you are in need of His forgiveness. Think about this for a moment. Maybe you've heard or have had a friend, somebody you've heard a story of somebody being pulled out of a, a burning car or picked up out of a drowning boat situation, saved at the beach, pulled out of a burning house or building. You've heard these stories. Usually the response of that person that's been saved is to tell that other person, I, wanna, I owe you my life. I owe you my life. I just watched the movie The Count of Monte Cristo a few days ago with my wife. And there's a scene in there where the main character, Don Tess, he was wrongly accused and he's put into this prison and he swims to this island. On this island, he realizes he's free after all these years and he's running down the beach screaming with his hands. He's so excited and all of a sudden the scene you see, there's a bunch of pirates, these bandits, sitting on this beach watching him. So he's not quite as free as he thinks he is yet. And as it turns out, one of these pirates has gotten himself in trouble and the captain of the ship is wanting to punish this guy. So he decides, I'm going to have a little sport with this guy. We're going to put you two into a knife fight. This will show that I'm going to punish this guy and I'm also going to be merciful to him. If he wins, he'll get to come back on the ship. If you win, you get to come on the ship with us. So Don Tess and this other guy get into this knife fight. And Don Tess is quite a bit more of a knife fighter than this other guy who was supposed to be so good. So he ends up getting the guy down on the beach. He's got a knife to his throat. He's supposed to kill him, and instead he raises the knife and plunges it into the sand next to him. He ends up saving both of their lives by being merciful to the guy on the beach. This powerful scene, the guy laying on the beach is so thankful for his life having been saved, he reaches up and grabs Don Tess by the shirt and pulls him down, and he says, I am yours for life. And this guy makes a commitment to give his life and yield his will and his life and his decisions and where he goes, what he does. He gives it fully to this man, Don Tess, simply because he was merciful to him. You might say in the natural, yeah, that makes sense. I might do the same thing. 
My friend, Dantes only saved that man for maybe another 30 or 40 years of life on earth. But because that man so valued his life in this life, he was willing to trade his will to be done in this life just to have life. That's how important life was to him. That's why when you get pulled out of a terrible accident, you feel this obligation to pay the person back or, you know, they saved me out of a burning car. I want to give you my life and how can I ever repay you? My friend, Jesus Christ, if you truly understand it, and I can't give you this understanding, only God via the Holy Spirit can. Do you realize how much more God has saved you from losing your life in a knife fight on a beach? Do you realize how much more God has saved you from being pulled out of a burning car? Do you realize how much He has saved you from, from being, you know, uh, being saved by the cancer, by the miraculous doctor who saved your life? Do you realize what Jesus Christ has saved you from? He has saved you from a burning eternal fire, torment. He has saved you from being separated from God forever. He has saved you from being tormented by demons for all of eternity. He has saved you from having to hear the screams and the cries of the wicked being burned alive forever and ever. The smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. Those who do not obey the gospel of God shall be punished with an everlasting destruction. He saved you from being separated from His goodness. He saves you from missing out on supreme happiness and blessedness. He saves you from missing out on being reunited with other loved ones in your life who have given their lives fully to Jesus Christ. He saves you from not being able to look upon and marvel at your Lord and your God and your Savior every day in heaven. My friend, if you're willing to give up your life to somebody who saves you out of a burning car fire and adds 20 to 30 more years or 40 years in this life, which is going, only going to add more trouble to you, there's no such thing as a trouble-free life in this world. Jesus said, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. What's he, what's he saying? He's saying, set your mind on things above where I am seated at the right hand of the throne of God, not on things below. Lose your life here to find it forever. My friend, if you went to the beach, you could take one grain of sand and put it in your hand and look at that. And if we were to say that that's a hundred years, which you're not going to live to a hundred years. I mean, I can say to you almost without a doubt, statistically, you are not going to live a hundred years. But let's just say for easy math, one grain of sand is a hundred years. Now reach back down and scoop up a whole handful of sand and compare the one grain to the millions that you can probably hold in an open hand, right? That one grain of sand in your left hand, a hundred years on life. Eternity that God is wanting to give you and God is wanting to save you for is more than all the grains of sand in all the beaches in all of the world and that's not even a start. My friend, you have to believe this by faith. And when you realize how ugly you are and you realize how much Jesus Christ loved you to descend from all of His glory, to come into this miserable, broken world and to be slandered and chastised and made fun of and to be misunderstood and to be beat down and to be spit upon and to be mocked and to be ridiculed and to be forsaken and to have no earthly treasures, to have no earthly home, to not even have running water, to not have a toilet that he can use, to not having a wife, to not having natural children. He gave up everything that you and I can't even imagine what he gave up. We have no idea what Christ gave up. We can only presume to speculate in our imagination. He gave up all of that while you and I were running in sin, not giving a lick about God. He died for you on the cross, shedding his blood, so that you could live forever and be forgiven of your filthiness and so that he, he could set you free from sin and the worries of this life that sin doesn't have to be your master anymore, that flesh doesn't have to be your master, the world doesn't have to be your master, that you can have a peace and a joy and a contentment to rise above any and every circumstance that comes against you, that you can live a life where you delight in suffering because you know you're, you're honored to participate in the sufferings of your Lord. 
that you can love him so much that you're willing to give anything, even your own life, and you're willing to live for him and suffer for him because of what he did for you. My friend, ask God to reveal to you what he has done for you on that cross because he who has been forgiven little loves little. My friend, a person who loves little will never surrender God and never enter the kingdom of God. You will never surrender your life to God and you will never enter the kingdom of God until you love God enough to give Him everything. I think about Olympic athletes who will surrender 20 to 25 years of their life and sacrifice friends and family and entertainment and education. They give up everything for what? To win a medal that nobody even remembers them for a few years later. And then many of them end up having to work at Home Depot or Lowe's because they sacrificed their education to get a medal. I think of business owners that slave away and give everything. I think of people that give everything to keep their marriage together or to earn money. I think of people who give up everything to come here to India to meet some false Indian guru who's going to supposedly teach them the truth and help them find. People give up everything for these things. You won't give up everything for Jesus Christ, the one who saved you from eternal hell, fire, condemnation, and who blesses you with his presence in this life and makes his home in your heart. But all you want is for God to fix your circumstances. My friend, I don't want to point fingers at you that I haven't already pointed at me. I'll never be more difficult than anybody that contacts me than I already have been on me. Okay? I lived everything I'm telling you. I wanted God to fix my life. I was praying for God to fix my marriage. I fought for God to give me back the life that I desired so much. I prayed, God, give me my life in peace too. Give me my marriage. Give me a good family relationship with my kids. Give me a good business. Give me good employees. I prayed for all these things I believed that I was entitled to have as a Christ follower. I tell you the truth. I'm so glad God didn't answer those prayers. I'm so glad God didn't fix my life so that I find it only to then lose it. I praise God for it every day. My friend, the Bible pronounces a curse on those who don't love God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, a curse be upon anyone who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, there will be a curse on your life if you don't love God with everything you have. And that curse, although you may be able to fake it until you make it to the end of your life, don't be one of those ones who hears as you call out, Lord, Lord, flee from me. I never knew you. You need the grace of Christ. I'm going to end this message by telling you, you can accomplish everything that God would have you accomplish, including a full surrender to God by the grace of God. I cannot fully surrender my life. It's absolutely impossible for me to do it. It was impossible for Persis to do it. The only way you can do it is to have the faith for it and the desire for it, and then God will bring you the grace to do it. If you truly love Him, go look at the last sentence in the sixth chapter of Ephesians and study very closely. Maybe pin it on your bathroom mirror and read what that says about how you can find the grace of God. Read what the implications are of that verse and understand that unless that's true of you, neither will the grace be present in your life. Everything you'll do in order to become like Jesus Christ in this life is accomplished by Christ through His grace. The way you receive that grace is through faith to believe that you can receive it and the desire for Him above all other things and people in this life because you love Him more than anything in anybody in this life. My friend, don't just come to God for what you think He can do to you. Don't even come to Him just so that He can give you nice stuff in heaven. Ask God to teach you how to love Him for who He is and for what He has already done for you on the cross of Christ. The Bible says you'll know a tree by its fruit. I love the fruit that God is producing in my life and in the life of my wife right now and has been for years because we did plainly what God's Word says. Luke 16, 15 tells us that what man highly values in this life, God finds detestable, my friend. If you want to make a full surrender to God, if you can honestly tell me as your brother in Christ that you fully surrender, just like Persis and I have done, 
My friend, count us in your corner. We'll do whatever we can help. But I want to tell you, please don't ask me for any advice until you've fully surrendered to Christ. If you have questions about surrendering to God, I'll be happy to help you understand it. And my friend, I'm not saying this to be mean to you. I'm telling you this, that if Jesus Christ will walk away from you because your heart is not right and because you won't fully surrender, how much more should I? If Jesus Christ can't help a person like you who won't fully surrender to God, how much less can I? There is no other way. There's a lot to learn about God after you fully surrender to Him. There's a lot to learn and it's not easy. I'll be happy to help you. There's lots of principles about maturing in faith, learning to hear God, walking in faith, overcoming obstacles. But I can't help anybody who's not willing to fully surrender because neither can Jesus. My friend, what I've just told you is the truth. And I just want to leave you with this final thought. I know you may be a little bit disappointed that I don't seem to be offering you much help and solution for your particular problem. But the very point that I want to make for you to consider is this. What if the very problem in your life that you're trying to solve is something God actually wants you to lose and give up? What if that marriage that is giving you so much trouble is something God would be pleased to see gone in your life? There's much that can be said on this subject, my friend, but you have to ask yourself, what is it that you have in your life that is not God's will? Take everything in your life like poker chips, your relationships, your spouse, your children, your finances, your worries, your anxieties, your dreams, your goals, every aspect of your life, your home. Take everything and push it all the way across the table to Jesus' side. Whatever He gives you back after you willingly leave it in His lap, you can know Father is pleased to give it back to you and that now, whatever it is, is part of His will for your life. Don't get so caught up in trying to fix your life now that you lose the life in the here and after. Remember, we go to Jesus for eternal life, not to fix all of our problems. Yes, He can do miracles. Yes, He evidenced the fact that He was the Son of God by doing amazing miracles for people. But think about what happens when the two brothers are in a quarrel over their inheritance and the one comes to Jesus and says, Lord, tell my brother who's taken all the inheritance to give me my half. Does Jesus start a counseling session with him? Does Jesus get in there and moderate that? No. He says, who appointed me mediator between you two? And then he says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And I tell you, friend, it doesn't consist in the abundance of his relationships either. My friend, remember these final words. Jesus Christ said in John 7, 21 through 27, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father. He says, many will say to him on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out devils and perform miracles in your name? He says, he will say to them, flee from me, I never knew you. And then he goes on and says, let me show you what the man is like who hears my words but does not put them into practice. He said, it's like a man who builds his house on the sand. And when the rains come down and the streams rise and the wind blows and beats against that house, it fell with a great crash because its foundation was on the sand. But the wise man who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the man who built his house on a rock. When the rains come down and the streams rise and the winds blow and beat against that house, it stands and does not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. My friend, you need advice for your life, but you need God's counsel. You need God's wisdom and you need God's truth. The only way to get that is to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. The only way to be a true follower of Christ is to intentionally put his teachings into practice. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? In John 8, 51, again, he says, I tell you the truth, anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. In John 14, 21 through 23, Jesus said, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He will be loved by my Father, and I too will love Him, and I will show myself to Him. 
My friend, if what I'm preaching to you today about surrender through love sounds like a radical message, if you think I'm talking to you about a different Jesus, I want to encourage you, go find out for yourself. Take the John 7, 17 challenge where Jesus Christ challenges you and I and he says these words, if anyone chooses to do God's will, which is to put his teachings into practice, see verse 16, that person will find out whether his teaching comes from God, meaning he's the real Jesus, the real son of God, or whether I speak on my own. My friend, I want to challenge you to find out the same thing. If you will put the teachings of Christ in practice, you also will find out that the words I'm speaking to you do come from the true one and only Jesus Christ. Take the challenge. Be willing to back burner all of your problems and all of your crisis. Put them on hold. Do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or what you'll wear, for the pagans run after all these things. Jesus tells you, my friend, and I'm encouraging you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, whatever God sees fit to provide for you, will be added to your life. There's no other way. Take the John 7, 17 challenge. Start from the very beginning. You'll hear all kinds of stories about how I failed along the way trying to follow Jesus, what God did, how he dealt with me, and how I finally found victory. And most importantly of all, you will be fulfilling the great commandment that God has given to me and to you, which is to go into all the world, not just making converts, but teaching people to obey all that he commanded. My friend, until you've done that, you could have all the problems fixed in your life and you still have nothing. You gotta find your Lord by learning his teachings and putting him into practice. May God bless you as you do so. If you have questions along the way after you've surrendered, by all means, let us know. We'll be glad to try to help you with God's help. Bye-bye. By this evil, and at a complete loss of what to do. Dear Michael, my husband took me from my family and my country. He married me and then brought porn into our marriage three days after we wed. He abuses me verbally, emotionally, spiritually, and even a bit physically. My marriage and my life have been a living hell for 27 years. Please help. I don't know how much longer I can take it. Another email. I am so frustrated with my life. Why won't God allow me to find a godly spouse? I am so lonely. Why doesn't he care about my needs? I have been hurt by so many people and he doesn't seem to care. Dear Michael, I've been unable to find work for a few years. I've gone through most of our savings. My wife is growing increasingly impatient and now my children are worried. I've been praying, but to no avail. I'm scared to death. I don't know what to do. Please help me. Another email. My husband had two affairs and got one of the women pregnant. I forgave him and we reconciled. Later, he became very sick for many months and I stayed at home to nurse him back to health. Once he got healthy, he left me for the woman he had the child with. Dear Michael, I am in an unequally yoked marriage. I thought for sure he would come to Christ. And even though he was so mean to me and hated my love for God, my church told me I just had to stay and wait it out. It's been 21 years and there is nothing left of me. I am an absolute shell of what I once was in Christ. I sinned against God by marrying him and then made it worse by not leaving him sooner. Now. I have paid the ultimate price. I have lost my vibrant relationship with Christ and I believe my salvation because my life is now being used as evil in the lives of others. Another email. I am tormented in my thoughts and have no peace in my life. I have family members that are messing with the occult and now I'm seeing shadows, hearing voices in my head, Hello, my friend. This is Michael Criswell with Relentless Heart. And I want to thank you for reaching out uh, to my wife and I in your pain to get some help. I understand. I have been exactly where you're at. 
I, for the first three years, three and a half years of this ministry, to the best of my ability, I tried to reply to each and every person that contacted me. And I really was blessed by it, and I believe a lot of other people were too. But I knew always that the time would come if God willed it, the volume of requests would surpass my ability to serve them. And in answer to that, I've decided to invite you this morning as I'm sitting here on my wife and I's front porch at our apartment in Hyderabad, India. I'm having some coffee. I'd like to invite you to join me with a cup of coffee. Perhaps you and I can pretend like we're at a Starbucks. <laughs> I'll ask your forgiveness for the sounds. It's a rainy morning and you'll hear all kinds of sounds of Indians getting ready in the morning and perhaps our neighbor's dog will start barking. But I just wanted to be able to sit down and have a candid heart-to-heart -heart conversation with you in an effort to try to encourage you and to try to help you fully understand the most important single subject about how I and many, many others have found the blessing and the presence and the help of God in our life, indeed in the most difficult times of our life. In three and a half years of doing this ministry, I've discovered that there are basically two categories of people once I've had contact with them. There are those who no matter what they've gone through, find God's help and His blessings and His presence in their life. And then there are those who do not. And I paid attention to what the differences were and I asked the Father to help me to understand not only my journey, how did I get from where we were at in a lack of a desire to continue to fight and find God. My friend, I could spend 10 lifetimes trying to help each individual that contacts me find the specific answers to their specific problems, including yours. I mean, imagine for a moment right now how much happiness you would feel and relief you would feel if you could say a prayer and God would instantly fix all of your circumstances in your life. Or if you could contact me and I could give you the exact answer and solution to your problem, you would probably be thrilled. But my friend, I want to tell you something, that there's something far more important to the Father. If you are one of His elect, if you are one of those who through His foreknowledge He saw before you were born that you would actually make a choice to believe in Him and to follow Him, then Romans 8.29 teaches us that God's primary purpose in your life is for you to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's top priority for your life is relationship with you. He desires to know you. He desires for you to be able to say that you walked with God. He does not desire for you and I to be able to say that we were Christians in the sense that we had a relationship with Christianity. God does not desire that we have churchianity. God does not desire to have us being religious, mindless robots. But God desires to have a living, breathing, daily, interactive relationship with you, whereby moment by moment throughout your life, the Father is your absolute greatest conscious reality. My friend, every day of my life, the Lord Jesus is walking with me. It doesn't mean that I don't have moments where He allows me to be touched and being tormented by demons. Please help me. Dear Michael, I'm only 32 and already suffering from erectile dysfunction because I have been addicted to pornography, because I have been addicted to porn and masturbation since I was 17. I cannot stop. I know I am doomed to hell. Can you please help me? 
Dear Michael, my marriage was on the rocks for years and I made a mistake of allowing a young lady that works for me to get too close to me. I was a fool and had inappropriate relationship with her, but it never led to sex. But because of her age, I'm now facing up to 20 years in jail and possibly having to register as a sex offender, which will absolutely destroy my life. I didn't do anything to deserve this, and the young lady and her parents tried to defend me, but my ex-wife, who is out to get blood, knows the judges and the district attorney, and she is out to destroy me. Please help me. I am scared to death. Dear Michael, I cannot stop smoking pot. I know it's wrong, but it's the only way I can get any peace. But then soon after, I feel guilt and shame, and the only way I can get any relief is to smoke even more weed. I love God, but I can't stop this sin. Please help me. My friend, that's only just a short sample that I've received from people in just the last three and a half years that I've been doing this. I want you to know you're not alone, but I also want you to know that some of these people received God's help. Some of these people found God indeed in their storm, but unfortunately, many others of them still have not. Many others of them have been defeated and they continue to be weighed down by the worries of life. They continue to suffer defeat at the hands of their own sinful, unwise, foolish choices in their life, the hand of the devil who beats them down where they have no strength left to stand up and trust God, the evil things that are being done to them by others, to where we're at today. But how have you worked in the lives of others? And Lord, help me to see what it is, the difference between those who find you and your help and those who do not. My friend, I remember being exactly where you're at. I want you to know you're not alone. I have heard stories from all over the world where at one time I thought my story was certainly one of the worst I had heard. And I tell you, my friend, I've heard stories now that make mine look like a Sunday afternoon walk on a beach. And I want you to know that there are other people besides just me. I'm not the only one. I just so happen to be called into a full-time vocational ministry to tell people about what God had done in my life. And I had the resources at the time to make a, a story about it. But there are many other people right now who all over the world, they have either been through what you're going through and worse, or they're actually going through it with you right now. These are the kind of emails that we receive on a daily basis from all over the world. Let me just read a couple of these and see if you can identify yourself with maybe some of the pains you're going through. Dear Michael, my wife left me and took the children and now she has turned them against me. I am in excruciating pain and I do not know what to do. Dear Michael, my quote unquote Christian husband left me for another woman and took all of our savings and left me with nothing. I am hurt and scared to death. Another email, my husband tried to murder me and then killed himself. The next man I dated committed suicide. Something is terribly wrong with me. I was about to end my life when God brought me to your story. Dear Michael, our daughter is dead. We believe her husband killed her for the insurance money, but the court is so corrupt and unjust that he has gotten off the hook completely. Now he has even turned other family members against us, and we haven't seen our grandchildren in years. We are completely devastated by